So this text in retraining um, that I've discovered uh, it was buried in a text, in a much larger text devoted to political and economic thought. Um, this is a text that goes back probably to the fourth century BCE. Um, and as I said, it's been overlooked probably for the better part of 2,000 years because it was buried, not in the ground, like a lot of Chinese texts uh, in recent discovery uh, in the past 40 years have been buried in the ground. But it was buried in a book, a book uh, that everybody consulted for early Chinese theories of political and economic thought. What was it doing there? Of course, that's a mystery. It was one of four short texts out of 76 texts in this collection called the Guanza. Uh, and most people consult the Guanza for other reasons. Uh, why, why it was there and how it got there is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but I'd like to talk to you kind of about the big picture of what's going on at this point in time um, in early Taoism. First of all, everything is taking place here in China. Um, is the pointer not showing now? Yes. Is it showing on the, but not on the screen? Yeah. Is it? I see. It's on the wall. It's on the wall. Oh, well. <laughs> so, most of what's going on in China is taking place. We think that the early Taoists um, uh, develop in two places here in the Shandong Peninsula and here right around the sides of the Yellow River. Uh, there's two probably different collections of uh, teacher and student lineages uh, that are founded upon a practice of breathing meditation that I've called um, inner cultivation from this text, an inward training that I've discovered and found. Basically, this uh, timeline of ancient Chinese history gives you some sense of where we are, where we're situated. Um, the Western Zhou period, the Eastern Zhou period. It's during the Eastern Zhou period that we start to get the texts that are the foundational texts of the Taoist and Confucian traditions. Uh, this text, Inward Training, was probably written down sometime around uh, 350 BCE but it may have been orally transmitted for many centuries before that. Uh, the reason we think that is that most of it is in uh, three and four uh, character rhymed verse. Uh, either the rhyme is every line or every other line. And, you know, rhyming uh, short uh, verses uh, are easier to memorize and to transmit orally. So it's actually thought that people became texts. They would memorize uh, whole texts, and they were living texts themselves. This is before people were writing things down. So that when you transmitted books orally, people memorized the texts. They became the texts. They were living human texts. It's really an interesting idea. Um, something we've lost in our electronic age. Um, so, this is finally been recognized as one of the foundational texts of the Taoist tradition. So what is Taoism? Taoism is this um, one of two indigenous religions and philosophies that developed in China. Um, according to Chinese tradition, Taoism was founded by this very shadowy figure named Lao Tzu. How many of you, how many of you have heard of Lao Tzu? Oh, Well-read group you have. Um, Lao Tzu supposedly, uh, Lao Tzu means old master, so it's a pretty vague name. Or it could mean the old masters, mm -hmm. because we don't have an indication of singular or plural um, uh, in these Chinese characters. It could be a collection of the sayings of the old masters. Some of you might remember Dutch masters. Um, <laughs> cigars that my father smoked when I was a boy. Um, so it could have been a collection of fellows that looked a bit like those Dutch masters, except the Chinese version. Um, supposedly Lao Tzu lived in the 6th century BCE. Um, I think I'll turn this one off and stay here. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, now he has to turn that off. <laughs> okay. 
No, you can turn it on. Yeah, can, it can be turned on from... Yeah. One sounds still alive. Yeah, there no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he lived in the 6th century BC. Um, and according to this old story, he taught Confucius. He mentioned Confucius in, in your opening prayer. He taught Confucius how to perform Confucius's essential practice better than Confucius could perform it. Basically, he schooled him in the performance of ritual and, and the rites. Doesn't that sound a little suspicious? Like, our guy one-upped your guy. Um, again, according to this tradition, uh, Lao Tzu on his way, uh, he left, went to the west, actually supposedly according to later tradition from uh, people who were introducing Buddhism to China. Uh, Lao Tzu, they picked this legend that Lao Tzu left China, he went through uh, the mountain passes in the west, he went, and he went all the way to India, and he became the Buddha. So when they introduced Buddhist texts from India to China, uh, supposedly on his way out west, uh, he was asked by the keeper of the pass to write down a text. And what he wrote down was this famous book that many of you have read, The Tao Te Ching, The Way and Its Power or Potency. Uh, fortunately, he also stopped for a portrait uh, which was <laughs> this is a much later imaginary representation of Lao Tzu. Um, but notice he's got these very wise eyes and long beard, very characteristic of sageliness. So according to tradition, Lao Tzu had many disciples, including uh, men named Wenzha and Zhuangzi and Lietzha, and each wrote a text that survived, and together they founded again, according to tradition, a school of philosophical Taoism. These philosophical texts advocated, among other things, the existence of an absolute power or force in the world that they called the Tao, literally translated as the way. <laughs> I had a teaching assistant when I first started here who had a, a young daughter and uh, she, uh, she was, uh, we were, we were discussing Taoism in class, and her daughter was listening to the radio, and it said, and the Tao is up today by 10 points. <laughs> she went, see, Mommy, it's on the radio, too. <laughs> but it's not that Tao. Um, so these philosophical texts, according to tradition, advocated um, these things, including a surrender to death as a natural transformation. Uh, this is the disciple uh, Zhuangzi. Uh, how many of you have read the Zhuangzi? Uh, just a few of you. So I, I highly recommend that. Uh, I won't be talking very much about that today, except to mention the fact that uh, I'm very struck by this text, and I've attempted throughout my adult life to emulate his appearance so I've worked on the mustache, though it's gotten a bit uh, whiter with age, but I could never quite get the hair. I tried many times. Um, and of course that look, that's the look I give to my sons when they say, oh yeah, Dad, I got in at one o'clock. Oh. <laughs> oh, you did, did you? So strangely, these philosophical works um, became the foundation of a later organized religious movement that arose in the second century of the Common Era um, as two millenarian rebellions against the imperial Han government. It's usually at this point that when I lecture that I tell my students that uh, hat makers can get really angry, hat sewers can get really angry, <laughs> but it's a very obscure pun. So millenarian means they talked about the millennium coming. But if you think about what hat sewing is, right, it's called millenary. No, no, sorry. If you have to explain it, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so there were these gr uh, grand millenarian rebellions at the end of the Han. And when the rebellions were quelled, their religious institutions remained and formed what became known as religious Taoism. This religion, uh, which featured 
worship of Lao Tzu as a deity, practices aimed at longevity and immortality, um, and which observed much of the religious beliefs of the Chinese peasants, um, represented an apparently major degeneration from the lofty mystical philosophy of Lao Tzu and his disciples. This has been the story for about 2,000 years. However, the Chinese have been digging. Uh, you know, Chinese, if you've visited, anybody visited China in the last decade or so? So, I mean, China's expanding rapidly. The building is, uh, is intense. Uh, from the time I first went to Beijing in the early 80s until the last time I went there a few years ago, uh, there were three ring roads around the city, and now there's six. And you can imagine how that's expanded exponentially. Uh, I, heard a, I heard a TV report that during the winter, there was a, what was it, a five-day traffic jam getting into Beijing. <laughs> and there were vendors who were walking up and down <laughs> and selling uh, noodles and uh, things to eat. Yeah. Anyway. So what they're doing is, but they're digging, and they're digging in the ground, and they're digging, and they're finding, they're digging, you know, foundations for buildings. And then all of a sudden, ah, oh my God, they discover a tomb, and they go, ah, got to call in the archaeologist, stop the project. Of course, actually, what they more likely do is, they say, oh, let's call in people on the black market so we can sell the contents of the tomb to them. Unfortunately, there have just been uh, published a, a series of texts uh, from a tomb probably sealed around 100 BCE uh, and that contain a version of the Lao Tzu that we've never seen before. But they came, they were, they came off the black market. They were bought by uh, Beijing University um, and they've been published by them. But nobody knows where they came from. They were taken, so, they, so the, the problem is the archaeological site was destroyed. So they don't know where they came from. You know, they can kind of date them using non-archaeological means, textual means. Anyway, so, but the digging of tombs uh, and discovering these caches of texts which absolutely change the face of our understanding of classical Chinese thought starts with the excavation at Ma Wangdui, uh, which was announced in 1973. Um, there was another important, and they found, they found two different complete versions of the Lao Tzu. Uh, the, the tomb was sealed in 168 BCE, and the two versions can be dated to 202 and 186 BCE. So they're really old, they're very close. They really form two branches of one lineage of texts. Um, and a curious uh, fact about them is, those of you who read the Lao Tzu know that chapters 1 through 37 are the canon or classic of the Tao, and 38 through 81 are the canon or classic of virtue or the way, of, or de or power. They're reversed in these two Ma Wangdui texts. Very interesting. They also discovered um, in a tomb at, at the Gordian uh, fragments of uh, a, what I would call either a proto-Lao Tzu or one of the texts that contributes to the Lao Tzu. Um, but the materials arranged very, very differently. And that tomb was sealed in 310 BCE. So it doesn't really speak to the fact that there was a complete Lao Tzu b before uh, this time. It just means that this could have been one of the attempts to put together uh, some material from, from a genre I call um, uh, early uh, it's a lit specific literary genre I call early Taoist wisdom poetry. Inward training is another example of that genre. Inward training and Lao Tzu share a lot of characteristics, uh, similar kinds of rhyme patterns, um, similar kinds of structures, except that Lao Tzu is worked over more. Lao Tzu shows uh, a lot of conscious editing that went into the compilation of each chapter. It's best brought out in the DC Lao translation in which he breaks up the sections of each chapter um, uh, into numbered sections. And so some are poetry, some are prose, and some are, you can see, there's a kind of an, an, an A poem and a B poem tied together with something like, and therefore it is clear that, or and therefore the text says that. Or then there'll be even almost a commentary, commentarial like explanation. So the Lao has been worked over. Inward training has not. Um, 
So recent scholarship has also indicated that there were many other significant sources of early Taoism than the Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, the most important of which is the text I'm going to talk to you about today, Inward Training, Neya. This work, I, will argue, I have argued in my book, contains the oldest extant, that is surviving, presentation of a practice of breathing meditation in uh, the Chinese tradition and therefore in all of East Asia. We're going to see some examples um, in my talk and if you'd like we can try out a couple of these practices because I've reconstructed, uh, theoretically anyway, some of the, a couple of these passages and what the meditation practice might have been like uh, which leads to the insights encoded in the practices. Um, it also indicates that a lot of the texts that were supposed to be part of the early philosophical tradition are really later forgeries. Uh, Wenza and Lietza probably uh, in the versions that we have surviving today date from the 3rd or the 4th century of the Common Era. And the Zhuangzi text itself is a highly stratified text representing at least five different authorial voices and covering about 200 years of compilation. So when we examine the Taoist tradition from the position that Neya, inward training, um, is its oldest text, not Lao Tzu, um, a much greater continuity with the later religious Taoist tradition can be seen, especially in terms of the meditation practice. The very same terms that are used to discuss breathing meditation and inward training are the same terms that are used to talk about breathing meditation in the later organized Taoist religion post-180 of the Common Era, post millenarian rebellions, and continuing up really to the present time. Um, so we've talked a little bit here about uh, the Tao Te Ching already. Um, it's, you know, it's extremely popular. So many of you read it as testimony to that fact. There's several hundred commentaries written on the Tao Te Ching in the Chinese tradition that have never been translated. Probably the only one that people know of is the Wang Bi commentary. Anybody know that, the Wang Bi commentary? Um, from the third century of the Common Era. That's been worked over quite a bit. Um, so supposedly written in the sixth century BCE, and that's probably what you came to believe about it. Um, supposedly written by this guy Lao Down who taught the rites to Confucius. But most importantly, there are no textual references to the Tao Te Ching before the middle of the third century BCE. None in the earlier Confucian texts, none in the earlier Moist texts, no, none in the earlier Legalist texts. And so um, it makes us question uh, the legend. You know, I mean, and the legend, uh, um, as I suggested before, is a very uh, convenient legend that Lao Tzu is the man who taught the rites to Confucius. Um, as I mentioned, this Guorian uh, tomb from Hubei province was sealed in 310 BCE. About 28 uh, material from 28 of the Lao Tzu's 81 chapters are found in that tomb, but organized in a different order. Um, it looks like, therefore, that the complete text of the Lao Tzu was not finished until sometime between 275 and 250 BCE, so much, much later uh, than the legend claims, and also much later than inward training. Inward training, uh, the data jing, the material from the Gordian, uh, are the parallels with the Lao Tzu, and there's a couple of other texts there, attest to this major early genre of early Taoist wisdom poetry, through which the ideas of these masters and disciples um, in these very, very loosely organized lineages were uh, created and transmitted. Um, yeah, I actually said all this before. Wait. Wait. This is just some, some of the ancient uh, early commentaries to the text. Um, the Huainanza uh, is another text I've worked on extensively. And I want to recommend this to you, not just because I headed up a translation project that spent 15 years translating it, uh, and because it may still be possible to get it at half price that Columbia's had a sale on. Uh, it's a thousand page book. 
Uh, it's a it's a compendium of everything the enlightened ruler needs to know in order to govern effectively, according to the Taoists in 139 BCE. So it's essays on cosmology and cosmogony, um, essays on geography, essays on what to do at the right at the, uh, in different seasons, what to wear, what to do. Um, essays on uh, self-cultivation, um, essays on the theory of history, on uh, philosophy of government, uh, collections of aphorisms, and it contains one of the earliest commentaries on the Tao Te Ching. Uh, but it's, a, it's what I call a kind of reverse commentary. Normally with the commentary, you probably see this in the, in the text uh, that you read. In the, there are probably commentaries in the Upanishads. Um, um, that uh, you have a line of text and then a couple of lines of commentary following it. Uh, but this, this different style that's reflected in both the Han Feitsa and the Hoinanza is that you have a long narrative and then at the end it says, and therefore Lao Tzu says, boom, and it quotes a line from Lao Tzu. So the narrative becomes the commentary on the line. You see what I mean? I should. Next time I give this, I'll throw us an example in so you can see what I'm talking about. So, but so it's, it's a little more abstract. You know, how do you interpret the narrative? Uh, the authors of narratives assume that the audience understands all the references and all the meanings. But this audience is a very different audience. So some of this is lost. So that is the other important literary uh, genre in which early Taoist ideas are created and transmitted. It's through narratives, through stories. And we find these story collections. Zhuangzi is just a wonderful story collection. And Huainanzi is loaded with these. Um, so I, I really recommend uh, the Huainanzi to you if you, have, uh, if you have an interest in such things. Uh, especially, the, the, I'm most interested in the most overtly Taoist chapters with, which deal with cosmology and with self-cultivation practice. But it's really interesting to see how those ideas become infused in the philosophy of history, um, in, the, in the philosophy of government. Uh, there's even a chapter on the emotional life of sages. There's a chapter on how to deal with uh, the customs of different peoples and how not to force the customs of central China on to the customs of all of these different barbarian lands that are being conquered. Some really interesting insights. And there's also this great sensitivity to the impact that humans have on the environment, which is strikingly modern. Um, and some people have decided that could be used as an underlying philosophy for an environmental ethic. Um, so I highly commend that book to you. Um, other early commentaries you can see were written on the, on the Data Jing. Let's talk a little bit now, finally, about Neya in retraining. As I mentioned, one of 76 texts in this Guanza collection, one of four short texts devoted to the exploration of breathing meditation and the insights it produces. These are known as the techniques of the mind texts, uh, significance previously unrecognized. It is, it is a text made of 26 distinct units of rhyme verse, whose rhymes and style uh, indicate it's in the same category as the Lao Tzu. Uh, we can date it before 330 or 340 BCE. Therefore, it is the earliest and oldest text that survives on breathing meditation in all of East Asia. Um, and when we see inward training and not the Lao Tzu as the foundational text of the Taoist tradition, then the apparently great gulf between philosophical and religious Taoism melts away. So it's like, a, it's like the missing link. Uh, it's like discovering the missing link. So instead of the line of descent coming from Lao Tzu and going down here and then getting messed up in between and having all these superstitious ideas come in, actually it comes from Neya and Lao Tzu spins off that line of descent. Zhuangzi spins off that line of descent and other early sources spin off that line of descent. But the line of descent to religious Taoist contemplative practices is directly from inward training. So I'd like to say a few words uh, about what uh, the big picture is. Um, uh, just a very few words um, from early, about early Taoism and when it became a school um, and how it carried into the Han Dynasty. So um, 
when you take this broader selection of texts into account, I don't know how visible that is, but it includes the Guanza, uh, the Zhuangzi, um, the Lao Tzu, and a few other sources. Uh, what you find is that there are certain almost textual fingerprints that indicate that this is a text that was created by people in this tradition. You've got a distinctive cosmology, a cosmology of the Tao as the power or force that infuses the universe. Um, you've got a, a meditation philosophy and practice, uh, inner cultivation. Um, you, and through inner cultivation practice, you empty out the normal contents of consciousness, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and when you get, become completely empty, you get directly in touch with or you merge with the Tao. But that's a temporary state. You stay in that state for a while, but because change is the motor principle of the universe, you inevitably come out. But when you come out, you return to the world in a transformed fashion. And then you're able to live in the world almost in light of, grounded in this experience of the Tao that, that acts through your personality and through your ego so that you're constantly in a state that Zhuangzi calls a flowing cognition as opposed to fixed cognition. Um, and he, there's a wonderful story in Zhuangzi where he talks about the monkey keeper and the monkeys. So the monkey keeper giving out nuts said, I'm gonna, said to the monkeys, I'll give you three in the morning and four in the evening. The monkeys were all in a rage. You can imagine monkeys being in a rage. You don't want to be there when monkeys are in a rage. And he said, okay, fine. I'll give you four in the morning and three in the evening. And the monkeys were all happy. So, you know, the reality of three and four and four and three was not different. But the monkey keeper was able to use his flowing cognition, lack of attachment to any one pre-established way of looking at things, uh, to respond uh, in that moment uh, in a spontaneous and harmonious way to the situation. That's the flowing cognition that results from um, emptying out the mind completely, emptying out the mind and body, getting in touch with the Tao, but then coming back into the subject-object world and living in a, in a transformed fashion. And you can do that, it frees you up. You live through your ego and all of its patterns, but you are not trapped within it. I see a looks of recognition in many people's faces. Um, so we have this and we have uh, this other element of political thought. So the oldest texts, like in retraining, don't uh, say anything about politics. But some of the other texts, like the Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu has a good bit of advice to rulers on how to govern. Of course, you govern by not governing, but that's still a philosophy of governing or not governing. Um, you, gover you govern through wu wei or non-action, um, spontaneous action that develops in the ego, but it's still directed towards rulers. Why? I think it bespeaks the historical development, a different stage of development from the early Taoist tradition. So instead of having relatively isolated teacher and student groups, probably living off in the forests or mountains, little by little, you know, you spend a certain number of years training with your teacher, and then what do you do? You could go back to your village, but some of these uh, teachers went to, some of these students who became adepts went to local courts and they got on the government payroll. And in fact, the whole reason we have inward training as a text is because starting in about 340 BCE, 350 BCE, in the state of Qi, on that peninsula that sticks out, that I mentioned was one of the sources, uh, source areas of early Taoism, yeah, they established in the capital city, in the state of Qi, something called the Jisha Academy. And the Jisha Academy, leading thinkers from all over the country, at least that's what, that's what the public relations man called them, but it was probably any itinerant philosopher who wandered in, um, was given uh, a position in the government to advise the king to argue, to debate back and forth with one another, and to advise the king on the best policies to pursue uh, in order to govern successfully. Probably what they had to do was, if they were orally transmitting a text, they had to recite it and it had to be written down and went into a library. Or if they physically had a text, they had to make a copy or have a copy made and have it put in a library. And that was the beginning of libraries in China, you know, philosophical text libraries 
We had some for doc historical documents. Um, and so these Taoist sages, having developed as uh, meditation adepts, were then in the position of giving advice to rulers. And one of the things that we start to see then is this later political dimension, which is reflected in the Lao Tzu. Um, and the Lao Tzu's government is government by non-action. But um, with the final, so, the, so you can divide Taoism, early Taoism up into these phases. You've got this individualist phase, uh, simply interested in cosmology and meditation. You've got a primitivist phase, cosmology, meditation, and simple governing advice. And then you've got a syncretist phase, which basically says the world's too complex, we can't go back. Uh, we have to, yes, be governed by a sage who's cultivated himself, but he has to set up uh, his government and he has to set society up so that it fits into the great cosmic macrocosm. So you cannot do anything that violates the greater forces of the heavens and the earth. So for example, you do not send out, um, an, uh, you do not begin an offensive campaign against the enemy in the springtime because heaven and earth are, are sowing seeds, there's, there are greeneries just coming out. You know, this is the time to create life, not to destroy it. You can do that in the late fall and in the winter, <laughs> things like that. Of course, there's a very practical reason. If you send all your, your men out to, to fight, then they're just all, you know, there's just fewer people who have this double duty for the women. They've got to take care of the kids and, and you know, the household and also sow the, the seeds and make sure everything grows. So there's a practical reason there. So that's the kind of syncretist phase, and Huainanzi represents that as well. Um, let me uh, talk to you about a few of the most evocative passages on the Tao in Inward Training. Uh, so there's three of them that are, that are grouped together, verses 4, 5, and 6, and I'd like to read these to you. Um, at least the first one, I have an idea for the second. Clear, as though right by your side. Vague, as though you're not going to get it. Indiscernible, as though beyond the limitless. The test of this is not far off. Daily, we make use of its inner power. The way is what infuses the physical form or the body. Yet people are unable to fix it in place. It goes forth, yet does not return. It comes back, but does not stay. Silent, none can hear its sound. Suddenly stopping, it abides within the mind. Obscure, you do not see its form. Surging forth, it arises with me. We do not see its form. We do not hear its sound. Yet we can perceive an order to its accomplishments. We call it the way. Very evocative of what this power of force is like. I'm going to come back to this in a minute because I want to use two of these other passages as part of a meditation that I'd like to do with you about the Tao or the way. I'm going to pull up a chair to sit in for this. Um, so, uh, one of the earliest uh, passages referring to breathing meditation is uh, verse 17. And this is a practice of coiling and uncoiling. So, for all the, to practice this way, you must coil, you must contract, you must uncoil, you must expand, you must be firm, you must be regular in this practice. Hold fast to this excellent practice, do not let go of it, chase away the excessive in perception, abandon trivial thoughts, and when you reach its ultimate limit, you will return to the Tao and the De, the way in its ultimate power. But saying, follow this practice of what's coiling and uncoiling. Well, let's, if you're willing, if it's okay, we can try maybe a short uh, two or three minute uh, breathing exercise, trying this out. Um, so I usually recommend sitting um, uh, with your feet on the floor. in whatever hand position you'd like.
begin by taking three deep and relaxing breaths. Begin by focusing on the upper abdominal breathing muscles in the solar plexus area. And then focus on the lower abdominal breathing muscles. And feel how, as you breathe in, from these two points, it feels like there's a coil that's expanding. And as you breathe out, there's a coil that's contracting. Remember to experience all three dimensions of your body, feeling this from the inside out. And we'll spend just a couple of minutes You must coil, you must contract, you must uncoil, you must expand. Being firm and regular in this practice Open your eyes. This is the kind of thing that we do in <clears throat> the courses that I teach in the contemplative studies area uh, that I and several others teach. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you more about that um, um, over dinner through questions and answers. So, how many do I have till six o'clock? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I think I'll skip this one, but I want to go to this uh, other really interesting uh, verse from Inward Training, uh, which I believe uh, is the oldest example in East Asia of mantra meditation. Uh, and I'll read you the passage first, and then we can try out a reconstructed meditation uh, that I think is suggested by this passage, and then I'll come back and read you while we're doing it, a couple of other passages on the Tao. Um, verse 14 says, The Tao, or the way, fills the entire world. It is everywhere that people are. But people are unable to understand this. When you are released by this one word, you reach up to the heavens above. You stretch down to the earth below. You pervade the nine inhabited regions. What does it mean to be released by it? The answer resides in the calmness of the mind. When your mind is well ordered, your senses are well ordered. 
When your mind is calm, your senses are calmed. What makes them well-ordered is the mind. What makes them calm is the mind. Actually, it goes on and talks about uh, within the mind, there is yet another mind. The mind within the mind, it is an awareness that precedes words. Only after there is awareness does it take shape. And only after does it, kind of does it does an idea take shape. And only after an idea takes shape is there a word. And when the word is implemented, uh, it affects the entire world. So it seems to me that that passage uh, suggests an epistemology of the Tao. So you so being released by the one word means that you follow, you concentrate on the word Tao as a mantra and you keep repeating it and it leads you to empty out the, your normal contents of consciousness and go deeper and deeper and deeper until everything falls away. You experience the Tao. It's simply spoken of as an awareness that precedes words. And then when you have that experience, you come back into the world gradually. So there's, you leave the experience, there's a reflection on it that forms an idea. And from the idea, you get the word that's most appropriate. You remember Lao Tzu says, if forced to give it a name, I call it the Tao, but it doesn't really capture it. You come back and you have this word and the memory of the experience are still being grounded somewhat in the experience and then you can implement it in the, in the world. And so I guess probably I'll have to close with this, but I think, I hope it's a good way to close. So, I've done a reconstructed meditation using the word Tao. So, basically, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, again, uh, cl close our eyes and focus on our breathing. But on the in-breath and on the out-breath, focus on the one word Tao. And as uh, we do this, I'm going to read you two other passages uh, from inward training that uh, just to let, let, let them stay in the back of your mind. You're still working with the one word Tao, but this is a... Allow your imagination to take in what uh, the, the word Tao means. So begin, as always, by taking three deep and relaxing breaths. Coiling and uncoiling. Focus on that one word, Tao. Breathing in, breathing out. Realizing that all the time, in every moment, in every second of our lives, we're completely embraced by this one word, by this one power or force that lies behind the word. The way, the Tao has no fixed position. It abides within the excellent mind. When the mind is tranquil and the breathing is regular, the way can thereby be halted. That is, the awareness, our awareness can be fixed. That way is not distant from us. When people attain it, they are sustained. That way is not separated from us. When people accord with it, they are harmonious. Therefore, concentrate it as if you could be roped together with it. Indiscernible as if beyond all locations. The true state of that way how could it be conceived of and pronounced upon? Cultivate your mind and make your thoughts tranquil and the way can thereby be grasped. 
Still focusing on the word Tao. The one word. As for the way, the Tao, it is what the mouth cannot speak of, the eyes cannot look at, and the ears cannot listen to. It is that by which we cultivate the mind and align the body. When people lose it, they die. When people gain it, they flourish. When endeavors lose it, they fail. When endeavors gain it, they succeed. The way never has a root or trunk. It never has leaves or flowers. Yet the myriad things are generated by it. The myriad things are completed by it. Forced to give it a name, we call it the way. Slowly open your eyes. Uh, there are many other uh, things that I could talk about, uh, but we've run out of time. I hope that um, in this presentation, I've been able to transmit to you something of the big picture context uh, in which inward training developed, uh, the importance of a contemplative meditative practice of focusing on the breathing, um, and the early Taoist meditation, how it led to insights into the nature of this underlying power or force called the way, how in early Taoist meditation we have this complementary practice of emptying out the contents of consciousness until we merge with the Tao and coming back into the world and living in light of the Tao, grounded in the Tao, able to flow into every situation and respond spontaneously and harmoniously to whatever arises. Um, and how that became uh, the source of very wise advice given to local kings and eventually emperors on how to govern effectively, but in the end was not chosen as the governing philosophy of the Chinese Empire, uh, quite simply because uh, it believed in government by the spiritually perfected. And let's face it, lots of other people besides the emperor could become spiritually perfected according to the methods that the Taoists advocated. And if lots of other people could become spiritually perfected, lots of other people could be qualified to topple the emperor. Hence the association of Taoism with millenarian rebellions throughout the centuries. Hence the Chinese government's great nervousness when the Falun Gong assembles and they don't have control over this assembly. Um, but the uh, combination of locating, uh, combining spiritual practice and political activity goes back to the origins of Taoism uh, and it is very, very deeply uh, embedded in the Chinese cultural tradition, so much so that still today the Chinese government, it makes the Chinese government very uncomfortable. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, your patience.